Hi, Jason. Good morning. How are you? Jason Gorman from ThatShelf.com. Congratulations on the film. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, James. Talk to me about how this project has evolved for you, um, uh, given, given your contributions. Uh, talk about the sort of initial role and how it's seen the sort of second life. Well, um, I was obviously a cinematographer for the principal photography of um, Justice League with um, Zack Snyder. Um, you know, when we, when we wrapped on the movie in 2016, Zack went back to LA. Um, I started a different job and um, Zack was editing, Zack was cutting trailers. I actually went to LA to, to color correct the first three trailers which were the first three official trailers, which were cut from the material that we, that we had shot. And then, um, you know, a few weeks later, I found out about this terrible tragedy that happened in Zach's life and uh, obviously his daughter um, committing suicide, which was a terrible thing. And um, kind of reminds me of that all the time. And every time I see something about the Snyder Cut, you know, because that's one of the reasons why we're here. So it's very bittersweet in a way. Um, obviously a terrible thing and, and Zach did the right decision I guess to step away from the movie and take care of his family which is the only thing he should be doing and so when, when the reshoots happened you know I was in a different film so I didn't get involved into that um, and you know I spoke to Zach afterwards you know a few times every now and then I obviously knew that he didn't have anything to do with it I did go to see the, the Joss Sweden cut of Justice League um, in 2017, which obviously, having worked in the original, I, I knew, you know, was not the film that we had shot and also not the film that Zach had wanted to make. So it was kind of a, again, strange experience. And then suddenly all this, um, you know, Snyder Cut movement kicked off, which was pretty incredible. Um, and kind of, yeah, kind of turned into a beast over the next, over the last three years into this big beast that not only allowed us to actually now see the Snyder Cut and, and give, give Zach that incredible gift of actually finishing his film the way he always wanted to have it, but also at the same time, you know, shed that light onto so many other things that like the American Society for Suicide Prevention and, you know, they collected money for that. and. Um, I mean, they flew a, a flew a plane over Warner Brothers in LA. I mean, that's you know all of those things, pretty incredible things, uh, you know, that that movement has achieved. So, very, yeah, it's a very strange, strange journey, really. I was going to say, in terms of the strange journey, look, this is this is this is a complicated subject because on the one hand, you had lots of people who very much, for very good and legitimate reasons, were championing the original vision of a director who had to leave a project for reasons that were incredibly tragic and unfortunate. On the other hand, you who've worked on Game of Thrones, you who've worked on some stuff are well aware that there is a tendency now for a certain elements of fan culture to demand stories to conform to their expectations. Do not allow the artists to tell the stories the way they want to tell them, but to ensure that it's shaped in the way that is satisfying to them based on their own uh, prerequisites or prejudices about what these storylines are. For you as an artist, as a cinematographer, if you could deal with those two things, I know it's a, it's a deep question, but if you could just talk about navigating this new world of fan culture, but also celebrating the artistry and the ability of the artists to actually speak their own mind. That is a big question. Um, I'll try. I mean, look, first of all, I think it's very important, aside from all of those fan movements and, and fan cultures, I think it's incredibly important to respect and honor the artist's vision, no matter what it is, whether it's a good film or a bad film, it doesn't matter. You know, everybody should be allowed to make the film that they want to make. Making a film is a, is a difficult, big journey, no matter whether it's small budget or big budget, you still make that film, and I think that needs to be respected. This whole culture that has come up in the last few years with social media and all of those movements, I mean, look, I'm. I've seen both sides. I've seen the good side of people being very supportive to me and being very, you know, supportive of me and my work. And I've also seen the bad side of it. Um, I've had the hatred and the, you know, the hate emails and all of that stuff 
at the same time. I think it's something that it's 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 the way that the world is, and we kind of have to deal with that. And if you are in it, if you're in that movement, I mean, look, I could decide if I didn't like it, I could decide to go over Instagram and not do that anymore. But for me, it's more important to, you know, if I can make someone happy, if I can make a big Game of Thrones fan or Justice League fan happy by showing some behind the scenes photographs that in a normal world they would never see, that's more important to me than at the same time getting a hate email because someone thought that episode three was too dark, you know? So I think, you know, it's a balance. If I didn't want that, I would just go with Instagram and you would never hear from me again. So it is what it is. I think you just have to deal with it. If you're in it, you have to deal with it. Uh, I'm going to ask a slightly technical question, which is after all the hard questions, because it's fantastic to be able to chat with you. As somebody that has seen, for example, this film at home because of COVID, and I've seen uh, the other works that you've done, uh, epic works that are cinematic, like Game of Thrones, there are people absolutely, they said, forget the tone, the actual photography, oh, it's too dark, or I can't see what's going on. I, who am watching on a ISF calibrated 77-inch OLED, um, appreciate very much the photography that you're doing. I'm just wondering if you could talk um, from that perspective of you are making these things to be experienced on the best possible cinematic way, whatever you're formatting, and then you're suffering with people watching them on their iPhones and then complaining that they can't see anything that's going on. If you just talk about that, that, that challenge of, of aiming for scope, but recognizing the reality of the situation. I mean, look, I'll I can only speak for myself, but I'm sure that this would apply to anyone else who wants to make TV or, or films or whatever. You know, you always strive to make something as most cinematic and as most individual as you can make it. You know, uh, you know, it's an interesting time right now because obviously, you know, this culture of watching things on your way to work on your iPhone or on your iPad or now at home because we can't go to the cinemas anymore right now, you know, that has changed the viewing experience massively. And I think it's a stage right now that we're going through, you know, I mean, I've, I remember clearly being on the tube. I was actually doing a recce in London on the tube years ago and I was watching, standing on the tube, what, looking at this young kid. I mean, he must have been like a teenager and he was watching something on his iPhone and I was standing right behind him and I saw it was Battle of the Bastards, you know. And I'm very proud of that episode. You know, we put a lot of work into it. And I said to him, it's a good episode. You should try and watch it at home on your big TV, you know? But they watch it on, on the iPhones and that's fine. The thing is, I think the thing I would say is that if you do watch it on your iPhone, which is completely fine, if it's your choice of how to watch it, don't then complain about it later because that is not, like you said, the way to watch it. I think right now we're just going through the stage of where, you know, hopefully, things will, you know, TVs are changing right now, you know. They're bringing out two to one TVs soon, are in, talk, in talks of bringing those out. You know, the aspect ratio on TVs will change. Everything will be catered more to having a good viewing experience at home. So hopefully even those shows which are, you know, you need to have a good TV to watch it on. Uh, and you need to watch it in the right environment. Hopefully that will become easier in the future. How do you watch films at home? Do I? Yeah, how do you? Well, I've, what do you watch? I've, I've got a bullet and I've got a sound bar. And if, if I watch a movie, you know, I watch films for different reasons. If I just watch a movie for entertainment, oh. you know, I watch it, I don't mind if the light's on, if I watch it during the day and it's a bit bright, you know, my kid's running around and I sometimes pause it and everything. But if I, if I decide that I want to watch a film because I want to enjoy this film as an experience, um, then I approach it differently. You know, then I wait until my kid's in bed, I wait until it's dark, I switch everything off, and I do it properly. You know, because only then I would feel I have a right to actually comment on the, you know, the way it looks, for example. Did you have any contribution to the decision to release Snyder Cut in 143 to 1? I don't, unfortunately. I'd love to have, I would love to have that idea. I think it's great. 
I remember uh, Zach telling me about it on our very first meeting, saying that he would love to um, show this on four, uh, in 4 by 3 but there's been a kind of resistance, obviously, as well. And I have to be honest, initially I thought, initially I was taken aback because I just stupidly assumed that, well, having seen Man of Steel and PBS, you know, it would be shot in 239 and widescreen and all of that. But as soon as I talked about it and as soon as I thought about it and as soon as, we, you know, I thought about those superheroes in my head in, in that composition, I thought, what a great idea, you know. You've got these big characters, um, big superheroes, and you show them in this big frame. And, and having seen it now, I think it just it works very well, very well. What do you think is the biggest um, improvement in digital cinematography that maybe the people outside the industry are not aware of? I think of things like home H, uh, uh, high dynamic range. I think of um, potential experimentation with high frame rate and whether or not that, that gets adopted or not. But uh, drones, all these things that are, are made overt, but are there more subtle changes to the art of cinematography that have taken place in the last few years that maybe we're not um, as familiar with as audiences that maybe we should uh, look out for and see some of the artistry that we may be uh, not accustomed to looking out for? It's not a good question, but I think, I don't even know how to answer that. I think in the end, you know, if you have a good script, all you need is a camera, you need one lens, you need a couple of good actors and you can make a good movie. You know, filmmaking itself is very basic. Obviously it becomes a much, much more complex with visual effects and special effects and all the other things that play into it. But really it's all, I guess, down to a good script, you know. Visually I always say like, you know, I don't know, from a camera perspective, I don't care what camera I'm using as long as I look through the lens and it looks good, that's all that matters, so. I'll try another way. Um... Uh, has camera technology simply gotten to the point where it's everything we want it to be? Lens technology doesn't seem to have been changing super much. It, it's gotten really damn good. Um, 4K, 8K seems really good. High dynamic range seems really good. For you as your tool set, you're no longer fighting with all these elements. Digital timing works about as well as we would expect. As we watch CGI improving, would you say that we are basically at the apotheosis, at the top of what we can do in terms of capturing cinematic images? Or is there stuff you still want to achieve? I don't know. I think, you know, there's always things that can get improved, things can get better. I mean, you know, only 11 years ago, around 2010, is when we were actually at the height of, after 100, almost 20 years of shooting film stock, you know, we were at the height of, you know, the film camera, Cameras were incredibly small and quiet. Uh, the film stuff was really fast and grain free. Um, the film cameras were super steady. You could go up to hundreds and hundreds of uh, sec uh, um, feet a second. You know, the cameras were steady. You could shoot high speed on film cameras. And at that very moment, when you reached that amazing level of, of craftsmanship, we come and say, oh, actually, let's turn it. Put it all to bed, and we're going to start this new thing called high definition. Um, and uh, we're not going to shoot film anymore. And you know, for years we were in this sort of gray area shooting. With a, I remember my first job after shooting a job on 60 mil or 35, shooting on a Cine Alta with a Pro 35 adapter um, that constantly broke. The cameras were absolutely humongous. It was like, you know for for three, four years until the Alexa came out, it was a complete nightmare. So we, you know, I think as humans, we tend to do that. We tend to go to the, build it up to the best we can be. And then as soon as we get there without being able to enjoy it, we go to somewhere else and start again from the beginning. So obviously technology evolves very fast these days. And, and what's happened in the purely just the digital camera world is incredible. I mean, if you look at the, you know, Alexa, Alexa 65, the Sony Venice, there's many cameras out there which achieve incredible images. I think the most important thing is that rather than striving for something, uh, you know, new or, or pushing that is more, you know, is for filmmakers, when you talk about filmmaking in general, is to, and I hope that's something that's going to um, 
come come through more is that we have more of a choice of what we want to do. You know, if we think actually we want to shoot this movie on 35 mil, you know, rather than it being production driven, that we can decide that ourselves. Um, or we say, you know, I want to shoot that digitally because I think that works better for this film. It'd be nice to have more of a balance there, which currently is more on the side of production rather than the filmmakers themselves. There's that clip that went viral, I guess, last week of the, the crazy drone fly through of the bowling alley and the other stuff. I'm not sure if you actually caught it. People are very excited. I about actually, it. Uh, I did. I, 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 yes. I, I really had 100 people send it to you. Um, I'm just wondering if that's it's interesting. It's incredibly important to watch. I'm not sure how it's going to, you know, it's not going to make any film any better. Well, well th this is it. So many people like the sort of, sort of flashy thing. And sometimes it takes away from some of the compositional elements <laughs> that the, the sort of stuff that goes back to the 1920s. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about the sort of, in, in, especially in a superhero film like this, of going for the epic and going for the big showy moment, but also going for the more quiet moment, uh, going for the thing that actually works for the character as opposed to the spectacle of it and the challenges of, of getting that on screen. Well, again, I think it's easy with someone that's uh because, you know, on the one hand, he's this very spectacle filmmaker who wants to create a spectacle visually and from every point of view, as we know, and we've all seen his films. But in the end, he's also a true filmmaker at heart where he wants to tell a story. And, you know, I remember shooting all the things. Uh, the one character I didn't know much about was Cyborg. And I remember shooting all of these scenes with Cyborg and his mom and his sort of background story. And, you know, Zach tells it in his very... Zack Snyder kind of vision, but you know, that was very important to him to tell that, to tell the emotional side of the stories just as much as all the spectacles of fighting or action sequences. So from when you're on set on a production like this, how do you stay focused? How do you avoid being overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of a production and the expectations of it and all those elements? Is it simply experience? Or there's specific coping mechanisms you have to ensure that when you're lighting this and, and, and actually shooting it, that you're getting what needs to be shot. Well, obviously part of this is experience. You know, the more you've done it, the more you kind of more at ease with it. But then anything, you know, anything can happen and there's always unexpected things that can happen. So you always have, you always have to be, you know, on your toes, I guess, which is a good thing. Um, but no, I think I've just been lucky to be working with so many lovely people, you know, like Zach or like Miguel Sapochnik, who are the, all the Game of Thrones with, you know. Um, you know, there, there are people who, who support your vision, who collaborate with you, who, you know, who understand you, you know, and so all of that makes it a lot easier, I think. What was the first film you saw that made you think you could do this? What was the first film that made you fall in love with cinematography, but also to give you the clips, but to say, I can do that? Well, I'm still not sure whether I can do it. I still, you know, you always doubt, you always doubt yourself. Um, but there's too many, you know, there's too many films. I mean, I've always loved films as a kid. And so I was watching tons and tons of films and it was ranging from, you know, from films like Indiana Jones to obviously Star Wars to classics like Jaws and Lawrence of Arabia and The Double Life of Puerto Rico. It was it was a complete mishmash of auteur films to Hollywood blockbusters to you know anything. I, I just loved I just loved I've always loved cinema as a way of not escaping but just as a way of creating another reality and, and, and being immersed in that in that other reality for two hours, three hours, ten episodes, whatever. You know, I've always loved that and, and I've always loved visuals and photography and as soon as I realized that there's a actual job to be a cinematographer, that was it for me. And when it comes to films like this, is there something specific you take away from? Are you mildly fanboy, but is there something from the set that you might have taken home and put on your shelf? I wish I had. I wish I had something from the set. <clears throat> um, but no, I, I actually, I didn't, I didn't, I, didn't have, I don't have anything from this one about really good memories. That's but yeah, that's but also, that's also. 
most important thing. Do you have anything that you've collected from any of your adventures on some of these uh, fantasy or science fiction or comic book films? Well, I've got a few things from Game of Thrones, yeah, I've got a few things. I've got a wolf head, a wooden wolf head hanging in my entrance next to the door. Uh, and posters, I've got a lot of the, you know, like the, you know, we do a lot of, um, like artwork for how something will look. So I, I always collect those because I think that's nice. When you are a cinematographer on a film like this, you're obviously integrating with CGI. Um, if you could talk about how that has shifted and how that has integrated of ensuring that the look and feel on set is done all the way through timing and all, all those elements so that you get a fully integrated film, especially in something like this, where there's other people involved in actually shooting the film. Yeah, that can, that, that can be a tricky process sometimes, but you know, I'm someone and I'm sure many other DPs are the same. You know, even after I leave a job, I would continuously speak to the editors or the visual effects supervisors and, and they would send me updates of what they're doing. We would continuously talk about what it's going to be like. And, and it was the same on this film. You know, I've been speaking to um, John Desjardins, our visual effects supervisor, all the way through over the last few years. Um, to, you know, just to see how it's going, but also to ensure that everything is going all right in the way we've always spoken about it. And, and really the main work you do beforehand and while you're shooting, because it's all about collaboration and figuring out how you want to do it and what you want to do. And, and I've always been very lucky with my visual effects teams in the, in, the, in the sense that we've always gotten along very well and we've both understood each other's needs and desires. And so I think the more you're on that same wavelength, the easier the whole process gets and the closer to what it should be. Thank you so, so much. Congratulations on a crazy journey, but I really appreciate you taking the time to chat about it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Appreciate that.